Fessenden was angry with the Navy for obtaining equipment outside the United States, and so did not submit a bid. Tesla was probably too upset with his treatment from the past and too involved with Wardenclyffe, which was under active construction at that time, to get involved, and so the Navy purchased additional sets from De Forest and Lodge Muirhead. In 1903, a mock battle with the North Atlantic Fleet was held 500 miles off the coast of Cape Cod. With the White Squadron, commanded by Rear Admiral J. H. Sands, and the Blue Squadron by Rear Admiral Higginson, Tesla's ally, the use of wireless played a key role in determining the victor. Commander Higginson, who won the maneuver, commented, To me, the great lesson of the search we ended today is the absolute need of wireless in the ships of the Navy. You know we are three years behind the times in the adoption of wireless. Based on comparison testing, it was determined that the Schlabe Arco system outperformed all others, and the Navy ordered 20 more sets. Simultaneously, they purchased an 11-year lease on the Marconi patents. With the onset of World War I, the use of wireless became a necessity for organizing troop movements, surveillance, and intercontinental communication. While the country was still neutral, the Navy was able to continue their use of the German equipment until sentiments began to shift irreversibly to the British side. Via the British Navy, Marconi had his transmitters positioned in Canada, Bermuda, Jamaica, Colombia, the Falkland Islands, North and South Africa, Ceylon, Australia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. His was a mighty operation. In the United States, the American Marconi Division, under the directorship of the politically powerful John Griggs, former governor of New Jersey and attorney general under President McKinley, had transmitters located in New York, Massachusetts, and Illinois. One key problem, however, was that the Marconi equipment was still using the outmoded spark gap method. In April 1917, the U.S. Navy completed the seizure of all wireless stations including those of their allies, the British. At the same time, Marconi was in the process of purchasing the Alexanderson alternator, which was, in essence, a refinement of the Tesla oscillator. Simultaneously, the Armstrong feedback circuit was becoming an obvious necessity for any wireless instrumentation. However, the Armstrong invention created a judicial nightmare, not only because it used as its core the De Forest Audion, but also because De Forest's invention was overturned in the courts in favor of an electronic tube developed by Fessenden. Never mind that Tesla, as far back as 1902, had beaten Fessenden in the courts for this development. With the Fessenden patent now under the control of Marconi, the courts would come to rule that no one could use the Armstrong feedback circuit without the permission of the other player. The most important ruling concerning the true identity of the inventor of the radio became neatly sidestepped by the War Powers Act of President Wilson calling for the suspension of all patent litigation during the time of the war. France had already recognized Tesla's priority by their high court, and Germany recognized him by Schlabe's affirmations and Telefunken's decision to pay royalties. But in America, the land of Tesla's home, the government backed off and literally prevented the courts from sustaining a decision. The Marconi Syndicate, in touch with kings from two countries, with equipment instituted on six continents, was simply too powerful. With the suspension of all patent litigation, and the country in the midst of a world war, Franklin Roosevelt, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, penned the famous Farragut letter. This document allowed such major companies as AT&T, Westinghouse, and American Marconi, the right to pool together to produce each other's equipment without concern for compensating rightful inventors. Furthermore, it assured contractors that the government would assume liability in infringement suits. On July the 1st, 1918, Congress passed a law making the United States financially responsible for any use of an invention described in and covered by a patent of the United States. By 1921, the U.S. government had spent $40 million on wireless equipment, a far cry from Secretary Long's policy of refusing to pay a few thousand dollars for Tesla's equipment 18 years before. 
Thus, the Interdepartmental Radio Board met to decide various claims against it. Nearly three million dollars in claims were paid out. The big winners were Marconi Wireless, which received $1.2 million for equipment and installations taken over, but not for their patents. International Radio Telegraph received $700,000, AT&T $600,000, and Edwin Armstrong $89,000. Tesla received a minuscule compensation through Lowenstein, who was awarded $23,000. In 1921, the Navy published a list of all the inventors in wireless who received compensation from them. The list contained only patents granted after 1902. Inventors included Blockman, Brown, Blondell, De Forest, Fuller, Harneman, Logwood, Meissner, Randall, Paulson, Schiesler, Von Arco, and Watkins. Note that both Tesla's and Marconi's names are missing. Marconi's could be missing either because his patents had lapsed, or, more likely, because they were viewed as invalid from the point of view of the government. In the case of Tesla, all of his 12 key radio patents had expired and were now common property. However, Tesla had renewed one fundamental patent in 1914, and this should have been on the list, as should have Armstrong's feedback patent. Radio Corporation of America. The U.S. government, through Franklin Roosevelt, knew that Marconi had infringed upon Tesla's fundamental patents. They knew the details of Tesla's rightful claims through their own files and through the record of the patent office. In point of fact, it was Tesla's proven declaration which was the basis and central argument that the government had against Marconi when Marconi sued in the first place. And it was this same claim, and the same Navy Lighthouse Board files, that would eventually be used by the U.S. Supreme Court to vindicate Tesla three months after he died, nearly 25 years later, in 1943. Rather than deal with the truth, and with a difficult genius whose present work appeared to be in a realm above and beyond the operation of simple radio telephones and wireless transmitters, Roosevelt, Daniels, President Wilson and the U.S. Navy, in the midst of war, took no interest in protecting Tesla's tower. In July 1917, Tesla packed his bags and said goodbye to the Waldorf Astoria. Having lived there for nearly 20 years, he talked George Bolt, Jr. into allowing him to keep a large part of his personal effects in the basement of the hotel until he found a suitable place for transferring them. I was sorry to hear about your father. Tesla told the new manager, George Bolt Sr. having died just a few months before. Preparing to move to Chicago to work on his bladeless turbines, Tesla was invited to the Johnsons for a farewell dinner. Robert was now directing the affairs of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, an organization which counted among its ranks Daniel Chester French, Charles Dana Gibson, Winslow Homer, Henry James and his brother William, Charles McKim, Henry Cabot Lodge, Teddy Roosevelt, and Woodrow Wilson. Catherine had been in bed for over a week with the grief, but this evening was too important, and she dragged herself out of bed and put on her best gown. Dressed in a straw hat, cane, white gloves, and his favorite green suede high tops, Tesla arrived with a large bouquet of flowers and a check for Johnson. The Kate's been ill, Robert managed to say before the lady of the house appeared. Taking center stage, as she always tried to do when he was around, Kate radiated an intense glow of amorous pride as she held back the flood of tears while she chatted on and on about how crazy she was about all of her grandchildren. Taking a weekend train to Chicago, Tesla moved into the Blackstone Hotel alongside the University of Chicago. On Monday, Monday morning, the inventor hired a limousine to drop him at the headquarters of Pyle National Corporation. Having already shipped prototypes to give them a head start, he would now work at an intense pace in an entirely new setting, his goal being the perfection of his revolutionary bladeless turbines. At night, he liked to walk down the street from his hotel to the Museum of Arts and Sciences, the only building remaining from the World's Fair of 1893. 
There he could stand by the great columns and think back to a time when daily hundreds of thousands would stream into a magical city powered by his vision. One Saturday, in the heat of summer, he took the mile walk along Lake Michigan, past the midway to a series of small lakes and a park which was once the court of honor. There at the entranceway to a place that once was, he found to his delight the statue of the Republic, still standing, its gold plating all worn away. With him was a letter from George Scherf. August 20th, 1917. Dear Mr. Tesla, I was deeply grieved and shocked when I read the enclosed, but I have the supreme confidence that more glorious work will arise from the ruins. I trust that your work in Chicago is progressing to your satisfaction. Yours respectfully, George Scherf. At the height of the world conflagration, the Smiley Steel Company's explosive expert had circled the gargantuan transmitter to place a charge around each major strut and nail the coffin shut on Tesla's dream. With the Associated Press recording the event and military personnel apparently present, the magnifying transmitter was leveled, the explosion alarming many of the Shoreham residents. And with the death of the World Telegraphy Center came the birth of the Radio Broadcasting Corporation, a unique conglomerate of private concerns under the auspices of the U.S. government. Meetings were held behind closed doors in Washington between President Wilson, who wanted America to gain radio supremacy, Navy Secretary Daniels, his assistant, Franklin Roosevelt, and representatives from GE, American Marconi, AT&T, and the Westinghouse Corporation. The J.P. Morgan and Company on the Board of Directors and the Marconi Patents as the backbone of the organization, RCA, was formed. It would combine resources from these mega-corporations, all of which had cross-licensing agreements with each other and co-owned the company. Cross-licensing agreements also existed with the government, which also owned some wireless patents. Here was another entente cordiale, reminiscent of the AC polyphase days, which was not so for the originator of the invention. It was a second major time Tesla would be carved from his creation, a secret deal probably concocted which absolved the government from paying any licensing fee to Marconi in lieu of their burying their Tesla archives. David Sarnoff, as managing director, would soon take over the reins of the entire operation. The New York Sun inaccurately reported, U.S. blows up Tesla radio tower. Suspecting that German spies were using the big wireless tower erected at Shoreham, Long Island, about 20 years ago by Nikola Tesla, the federal government ordered the tower destroyed, and it was recently demolished with dynamite. During the past month, Several strangers had been seen lurking about the place. The destruction of Nikola Tesla's famous tower shows forcibly the great precautions being taken at this time to prevent any news of military importance of getting to the enemy. At the end of the war, President Wilson returned all remaining confiscated radio stations to their rightful owners, American Marconi, now RCA. Of course, was the big beneficiary. In 1920, the Westinghouse Corporation was granted the right to manufacture, use, and sell apparatus covered by the Marconi patents. Westinghouse also formed an independent radio station, which became as prominent as RCA. At the end of the year, Tesla wrote a letter to E.M. Hare, president of the company, offering his wireless expertise and equipment. November 16, 1920. Dear Mr. Tesla, I regret that under the present circumstances we cannot proceed further with any developments of your activities. A few months later, Westinghouse requested that Tesla speak to our invisible audience some Thursday night in the near future over our radio telephone broadcasting station. November 30th, 1921. Gentlemen, 21 years ago I promised a friend, the late J. Pierpont Morgan, that my world system, then under construction, would enable the voice of a telephone subscriber to be transmitted to any point of the globe. 
I prefer to wait until my project is completed before addressing an invisible audience and beg you to excuse me. Very truly yours, N. Tesla. 42. Transmutation. 1918 to 1921. I come from a very wiry and long-lived race. Some of my ancestors have been centenarians, and one of them lived 129 years. I am determined to keep up the record and please myself with prospects of great promise. Then again, nature has given me a vivid imagination. Nikola Tesla Tesla's life work was his World Telegraphy Center. Partially materialized on the physical plane as Wardenclyffe, this was the inventor's holy grail, the key to anointment. In 1917, the project was demolished, and in that sense, so was the inventor. Capable of recognizing the absurdities of life and drawing from transcendent energies, the mystic sought regeneration by consummating his grand plan in fantasy form and by seeking a new philosopher's stone. One year earlier, when Tesla's project was at its bleakest, he had formed an alliance with one of his most ardent admirers, Hugo Gernsbach, editor of Electrical Experimenter. Gernsbach had first heard about Tesla when he was a child growing up in Luxembourg in the late 1890s. It was at this time that the ten-year-old came across the fantastic picture of the emblazoned electrician sending hundreds of thousands of volts through his body, and the declaration in the accompanying article that he was the grandest wizard of the age. Considered by most futurologists to be the founder and father of science fiction, Gernsback studied electronics at Bingen Technicum in Europe before immigrating to America at the age of 19 in 1903. With his mind totally captivated by the fantastic union of science and fantasy, the exuberant youth wrote a spectacular tale which took place in the year 2660 called Ralph 124C41+, which he serialized in his new magazine Modern Electronics. Simultaneously, he also opened up Hugo Gernsback's Electro Importing Company, an all-purpose electronic shop located under the L at Fulton Street. There, the new breed of amateur ham operators could buy whatever they wanted and browse through the biggest bunch of junk you ever saw. Gernsback's first meeting with Tesla was in 1908, when he stopped at the inventor's lab to view the new turbine. Gernsback wrote, The door opens, and out steps a tall figure, over six feet high, gaunt but erect. It approaches slowly, stately. You become conscious at once that you are face to face with a personality of high order. Nikola Tesla advances and shakes your hand with a powerful grip, surprising for a man over sixty. A winning smile from piercing light blue-gray eyes set in extraordinary deep sockets fascinates you and makes you feel at once at home. You are guided into an office immaculate in its orderliness. Not a speck of dust is to be seen. No papers litter the desk. Everything just so. It reflects the man himself, immaculate in attire, orderly and precise in his every movement. Dressed in a dark frock coat, he is entirely devoid of all jewelry. No ring, stick pin, or even watch chain can be seen. In 1916, the inventor edited a consequential article for Gernsbeck on the magnifying transmitter. The inventor also promised to think more seriously about putting his life story down on paper. In fact, he wrote a short first draft for Scientific American, which he embellished for the Edison Medal acceptance speech. By this time, Gernsback had also secured the talents of the gifted illustrator Frank R. Paul. Destined to be the most influential science fiction artist of the 20th century, Paul was able to render the possible development of any invention from a raw idea into a picture fantasy. With a penchant for drawing futuristic scenarios such as Goliath-sized insects, spaceships orbiting planets, and a variety of humanoidian mad scientists conquering galactic empires, Paul advanced to become the premier cover artist for Electrical Experimenter and later 
amazing stories and science wonder stories. He was assigned the role of completing Tesla's tower in picture form. The drawing, replete with fully functioning Wardenclyffe transmitters and Tesla wingless airfoils beaming down death rays to incoming ships, not only became a fantastic cover for electrical experimenter, it also became the centerpiece of the wizard's new letterhead. As alchemist, Tesla transformed the ruins of his station into a fantastic Gernsbachian world telegraphy center, as he also transformed himself, leaving New York City to begin anew with his next major creation. Before he left in June 1917, the inventor wrote Jack Morgan, hoping optimistically because of new developments, to pay off his debt to the financier. In about four months, my big ship is still to come in, but I have now a marvelous opportunity, having perfected an invention which will astound the whole world. Cryptically, Tesla said that the invention would afford an effective means for meeting the menaces of the submarine. Whether he was talking about a long-range radar system, a remote-controlled torpedo, or some other invention, is uncertain. The following month, Tesla moved to Chicago, and he stayed there through November 1918, working with Pi National on the perfection of his turbines. Here, during the day, with the slate clean, the gangly mechanic could continue to battle the demons by plunging himself into a brand new endeavor. At night, as creative author, the Cognoscenti sketched out the first draft of his expanded autobiography. Most of the time he drew from his own capital, for fear of causing difficulties with the new partners. He knew he would eventually receive compensation because the Chicago company had signed an agreement promising cash payments and guarantees with the expiration of their option, but carrying costs were becoming a problem. To handle expenses in the interim, the inventor requested that Scherf step up the pressure on receiving royalties from the various wireless companies. His greatest source of income was probably the Waltham Watch Company, which was now in the active stage of marketing his speedometer. Even though the war was still going on, the inventor expected to receive compensation from Telefunken after the hostilities cease, even though he would have to apply to the war trade board under the Trading with the Enemy Act for a license to receive payment. Progress on the turbines was hampered by numerous obstacles. Nevertheless, the inventor was delighted with the extraordinarily efficient personnel and overall organization of the Chicago firm. As the disks could rotate at speeds ranging from 10,000 to 35,000 RPM, the centrifugal force tended to elongate them. Thus they were subject to fatigue and ran the risk of cracking after performing for long periods of time. Perceived by skeptical engineers as fatal flaws, Tesla endeavored to hammer home the point that stress was a factor in all engines. Thus, much of the time in Chicago was spent experimenting with different alloys and inventing means for instantaneously regulating orthorotational speed and centrifugal pressure to minimize the stress factor. For instance, suppose that the steam pressure of the locomotive would vary from, say, 50 to 200 pounds no matter how rapidly, this would not have the slightest effect on the performance of the turbine. In January 1918, the U.S. Machine Manufacturing Company inquired about placing one of Tesla's turbines inside an airplane, and a few months later, the Chicago Pneumatic Tool Company also expressed interest. Tesla was writing Scherf, expecting the invention to yield $25 million per year. However, there was still the difficulty of perfecting it, and Tesla was still not free of the numerous other problems of his life, such as the past debts and the continuing quagmire of litigation. During the summer, the inventor twisted his back and was laid up for several weeks. During Tesla's time in Chicago, he calculated his operating expenses at $17,600, with revenues of $12,500. Pile National tried to get out of their debt by sending a check for $1,500, but Tesla returned the token payment and threatened suit. Meanwhile, back at home, the sheriff took possession of the Woolworth office, so Tesla had to wrestle some capital from Pyle National to release his company. In New York, George Sheriff
continued to handle all of the details. Concerning his relationship with the government, as stated in Chapter 41, most of Tesla's wireless patents had expired, and his 1914 patent was complicated by its clash with the Marconi claim. However, he was negotiating with the government on an engine for a plane, writing to the Bureau of Steam Engineering at this time. In litigation, Tesla won a few thousand dollars from Lowenstein, lost a $67,000 case against a Mr. De La Verne, in part because he refused to travel back to New York to testify, and had to pay out $1,600 to A. M. Foster for non-payment of services rendered. Before returning to Manhattan for the last months of 1918, the inventor traveled to Milwaukee to visit the Alice Chalmers people. There he was met by the astute but pedantic head engineer Hans Dahlstrand. After providing various articles and records from his work at the Edison Station and Pyle National, a contract was drawn up for Tesla to return to Milwaukee and develop the engine with Dahlstrand. Skeptical from the start, the learned head engineer reluctantly agreed to defer to Tesla's wishes and begin a preparatory investigation of the turbine before he arrived. Throughout this period, 1917 to 1926, the inventor spent most of his time outside New York City. In the years 1917 to 1918, he was in Chicago with Pyle National. In 1919 to 1922, he was in Milwaukee with Alice Chalmers. For the last month of 1922, he was in Boston with the Waltham Watch Company, and in the years 1925 to 1926, he was in Philadelphia working on the gasoline turbine at Bud Manufacturing Company. Tesla also sold a motor which was used in motion picture equipment to Wisconsin Electric in 1918, and a valve conduit or unidirectional fluid flow tube to an unspecified oil company. This last invention, which can also be called a fluid diode, could not only be used to pump oil from the ground, but also be attached to the bladeless turbine to turn it into a combustion engine. According to Tesla expert Leyland Anderson, this invention is the only valving patent without moving parts. It has been used in attempts to develop micro-miniature radiation-hardened logic circuits and simple fluid computers. Waltham Speedometers and Automobile Clocks Every progressive automobile manufacturer is adding improvements to his car. This is why the only air friction speedometer in the world, invented by Nikola Tesla, perfected and developed by Waltham, has won the unqualified approval of the world's great automotive engineers. You will find this instrument upon such cars as the Cunningham, Lafayette, Leach, Biltwell, Lincoln, Packard, Pierce Arrow, Renault, Rolls-Royce, Stevens Durier, Wills St. Clair, and others. The speedometer of instantaneous accuracy. The inventor arrived at the Copley Plaza in Boston to negotiate with Mr. May, the manager of the factory, the advance and royalty schedule. Concerning revenues, Tesla received $5,000 from Waltham, assigning them three of his patents in 1922 for a speedometer and tachometer. This agreement included royalties, which he received until at least 1929. Pyle National eventually paid him $15,000 and maybe $30,000 in 1925. From Bud National, he received $30,000 for the turbines, and probably a similar amount from Alice Chalmers, from whom he was expecting profits on the order of a quarter of a million dollars per year. George Sheff received 5% from most of these contracts. Tesla arrived back home at the tail end of 1918 in time for Christmas dinner with the Johnsons. He stayed for a brief time at the Waldorf, and then moved to the Hotel St. Regis, where he lived off and on for the next few years. The great influenza epidemic was just in its beginning stages, and Catherine was one of the first to display signs of its ravages. In the next year, over a billion people were infected, and 20 million died worldwide. She was lucky to survive. Her health deteriorated throughout the year, and by the following Christmas, she experienced episodes during which she lost consciousness three times within a single day. Perhaps heightened by the severity of the situation and with new income from Waltham, 
Tesla paid Robert checks totaling at least $1,500 during this period. Throughout 1919, Tesla's autobiography appeared in serialized form in Gernsback's Electrical Experimenter. Paired with photographs and a series of spectacular Frank Paul drawings, the story began as an unusual tale of a wizard child growing up in another era in a faraway land. The account of the early years of Tesla's life oozed charm and wit with its numerous Mark Twainian depictions of amusing anecdotes, harrowing experiences, life with his inventive mother, preacher father, prodigal brother, and three doting sisters. Digging deep into his past, Tesla explored the tragedy of his brother's death, how it impacted his career decision, the traumatic move away from the idyllic farm to the clutter of gospage, his college years, engineering training in Europe before coming to America, and his early meetings with Edison, Westinghouse, and members of the Royal Society of London. Also included was an uncommon description of his peculiar powers of eidetic imagery out-of-body experiences, childhood illnesses, phobias, and idiosyncrasies. In month after month of fascinating reading, the pundit detailed the development of his ideas, his physical breakdown, and opening up of the third eye experience, an accompanying revelation which led to the development of the rotating magnetic field, his creation of the teleautomaton, work in Colorado Springs, and the grand Wardenclyffe World Wireless design. This liaison with Gernsback supplied the inventor with a steady income and helped Electrical Experimenter boost its circulation to around 100,000. Simultaneously, MN Inventions also provided the world with a notable autobiographical testimony of one of the most singular and controversial personalities of the age. The year also saw numerous articles about Marconi's recent experiences intercepting impulses possibly emanating from extraterrestrials, with Professor Pickering writing Ella Hugh Thompson that he might have detected vegetation on the moon, and a resurgence of interest in the Canals of Mars scenario, the press jumped at the Italians far out declaration and grilled him for additional details. Stealing Tesla's thunder even on this front, Marconi proclaimed that he had often received strong signals out of the ether which seemed to come from some place outside the earth and which might conceivably have proceeded from the stars. As to the language problem of communicating with the Martians, Marconi said that it is an obstacle, but I don't think it's insurmountable. You see, one might get through some such message as 2 plus 2 equals 4 and go on repeating it until an answer came back signifying yes. Mathematics must be the same throughout the physical universe. Seeking redress in a variety of ways, Tesla sought publicity in electrical world where he attributed the Italian signals to an undertone metronome effect emanating from other wireless operators. Anticipating the possibility that a critic might describe the same mechanism to his own extraterrestrial encounter of 1899, Tesla added, At the time I carried on those investigations, there existed no wireless plant capable of producing a disturbance perceptible in a radius of more than a few miles. This, of course, was a false premise, as Marconi at that time was already sending messages hundreds of miles. Johnson wrote Tesla, that when Marconi repeats your idea, it is no longer laughed at. But in some circles, this did not seem to be the case. Celestial Movies Mr. Tesla has small confidence in the Marconian idea of getting into communication by way of mathematics. He would prefer to send pictures by wireless, the human face, for example. But suppose Mars does not like your face. That will be a regrettable rebuff to scientific investigation. If civilization on Mars is as old as we're asked to believe, the Martians have no doubt acquired their own taste in faces. Although the Christmas dinner of 1919 was marred by Catherine's ill health, it was overshadowed by good news. President Wilson had appointed Robert ambassador to Italy. With mixed emotions and Catherine apparently recovering her health, 
Tesla's friends left for Europe, where they stayed throughout the following year. Now, really alone, the wizard continued his slide from public scrutiny. Copied, mocked at, and ultimately abandoned by the world he helped create, Tesla tried to keep his life in perspective and contain his anger by doing his best to transform it. But over time, the irony of it all took its toll and caused an already eccentric individual to exaggerate already strange ways. Tesla would become more fanatical about cleanliness and spend more time walking the streets after hours, circling his block three times before entering the St. Regis and avoiding stepping on cracks on the sidewalks. Some said he peeked in windows and liked to watch others in voyeuristic ways. Practicing gastronomical frugality, the celibate slowly turned away from the meat and potatoes of life and eventually from eating solids altogether. Now he would rarely write in pen, preferring the less definite pencil. He would spend more time by himself, feeding the pigeons at midnight by the 42nd Street Library, or stealing away via the Staten Island Ferry to a quiet farm where he could block out the city and search once again for his fountainhead. With the Johnson's departure, he left for Milwaukee to consummate his relationship with Alice Chalmers. Much of his time in Wisconsin was invested in trying to perfect the turbine. However, he had reached an impasse, what Sartre calls a counter-finality or unforeseen event which opposes the goal intended, with Hans Dahlstrand, head engineer. Thwarted, Tesla had no recourse but to return to New York. So upset was he that he refused to talk about it when his biographer, Jack O'Neill, questioned him on the Milwaukee experience. Alice Chalmers had issued Dahlstrand's detailed report describing a long list of serious problems, as he saw it, in the manufacture of the turbine. Aside from the fatigue and cracking of the discs, Dahlstrand also cited additional impediments, including only a 38% efficiency performance, a decrease of mechanical efficiency as steam pressure increased, a problem in designing attachment gears needed to join the turbine to other units, and a high cost of production. Another factor was that the present-day motors, such as the Parsons turbine, which was being developed by Westinghouse, or the Curtis motor, being developed by GE, were operating satisfactorily. This question of the failure of the Tesla turbine was posed to a number of Tesla experts. Leyland Anderson found that manufacturers interested in the Tesla turbine all say it is a fine concept and an excellent machine, but there are too many support systems to be replaced for a machine not that much better in performance. And that is the point. The Tesla turbine is good, but not that much better. C.R. Possell president and chief engineer of the American Development and Manufacturing Company, one of the only existing organizations working on manufacturing Tesla bladeless turbines and pumps, offered a somewhat different explanation. Mr. Possell, who initially worked on the Tesla boundary layer drag turbine during the Korean War for the military, and who has been actively trying to perfect the turbine for 35 years, stated that the main problem had simply to do with the high cost of research and development. According to Possel, Tesla was about 25 to 30 years ahead of his time. Metallurgy was not what it is today. Magnetic bearings are a whole new science. He didn't have the right materials. Instrumentation for measuring performance was in its infancy, and it was hard to demonstrate the turbine adequately. Somewhere between the first prototype and the first use of it, you're going to have hundreds and hundreds of man-hours, and the turbine didn't get that. Possel gave as one example, and there are numerous others, the millions of man-hours required to get a plane to fly at Mach 1. At present, the Tesla pump, based on the same technology, has been used by Jerry Labine as a replacement for the motor in the jet ski recreational vehicle, and also it has been further developed by Max Gerth, inventor of the disk flow pump. Utilizing Tesla's basic idea and principles associated with the structure of a vortex, responsible for such events as whirlpools and tornadoes, and laminar flow, i.e. the natural gentle movement through fluids, Gerth has been able to increase the space between the disks. Thus, he has improved its ability to move such difficult products as solid waste 
and petrochemicals. Whereas a normal pump would have their blades pitted and corroded by coming into contact with the assorted troublesome products, the boundary layer drag pump has no blades and therefore avoids that entire problem. Fossil not only sees a day when the pump will be used inside the human body, as for instance a heart valve, but also a day when the turbine is perfected. One of the great advantages of a bladeless Tesla engine is its ability to withstand extremely high temperatures. Bladed turbines are about at their maximum, Fossil said, meaning that they can run at about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Although GE is experimenting with turbines that can run at 2,200 degrees. If you could boost the temperature an additional 350 degrees, you would double its horsepower output. Fossil is convinced that the bladeless turbine built with new ceramic components could run at about 2,700 degrees, which would effectively triple the horsepower performance. Thus, Fossil is also working to design an engine to compete with the Pegasus engine found in the VTOL, Vertical Takeoff and Landing, Harrier Jet. This VTOL of the future has been named the Phalanx. The vehicle will not come about, however, without large funding and commitment from the highest levels of industry and government. The waiter was surprised to see an elegant gentleman sitting at the breakfast counter before the restaurant was officially opened. Aren't you Dr. Tesla? the fellow inquired, amazed to see such an important man back in town after so many years. Having received permission from the owner to eat as early as possible, Tesla replied in the affirmative. He had journeyed to Colorado Springs from Milwaukee, retracing his past and looking toward a possible future where he might erect another wireless station. With a key from Dean Evans of the local engineering school, the inventor was able to utilize the lab to work on some technical calculations. Enjoying the much-needed respite and perhaps a quick jaunt in a hot spring, the inventor had returned to his beloved retreat. There, the spry mountaineer could perch himself like a phoenix on a cliff to sit and contemplate Thor's design and watch the lightning storms that crackled along the jagged horizon. 43. The Roaring Twenties, 1918 to 1927. I have been feeding pigeons, thousands of them for years, but there was one, a beautiful bird, pure white with light gray tips on its wings. That one was different. It was a female. I had only to wish and call her, and she would come flying to me. I loved that pigeon as a man loves a woman, and she loved me. As long as I had her, there was purpose to my life. Nikola Tesla In November 1918, Germany signed the armistice, ending the Great War. Shortly thereafter, Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated his throne and fled to Holland. His country had incurred a debt of $33 billion to the Allies. The new heroes of the age were aeronauts like Eddie Rickenbacker, hailed as the top ace with 26 down Messerschmitts. Humans were leaping continents the following year with the British propelling the sturdy dirigible R-34 from Edinburgh to Roosevelt Field and back to London in seven days. This first ever round-trip transatlantic airship journey was commanded by Major G. H. Scott of the Royal Air Force, complete with his 30-man crew, and Willie Ballantyne, a 23-year-old stowaway. The same year, with Tesla, Thompson, Marconi, and Pickering bickering about Martian signals and lunar plant life, Robert Goddard, military rocket expert and physics professor from Clark University, proposed a seemingly outrageous trajectory for sending a man to the moon. Even Tesla thought the scheme far-fetched, for the known fuels of the day did not have sufficient explosive power, and even if they did, he doubted that a rocket would operate at 459 degrees below zero, the temperature of interplanetary space. In 1920, William Jennings Bryan led the campaign to institute prohibition. Anne Morgan and her suffragettes gained the right to vote for women. And four motion picture celebrities, Charlie Chaplin, D.W. Griffith, Mary Pickford, and her new husband, Douglas Fairbanks, 
formed United Artists. As the war faded, sports figures became the new heroes. The young Red Sox pitcher Babe Ruth, making the papers after being sold to the Yankees for a whopping $125,000. Hugo Gernsback tried to put Tesla on the masthead of yet another futuristic electrical experimenter spin-off, but his financial offer was in Tesla's eyes puny, and he rejected it. Feeling that he'd been underpaid for his autobiography, Tesla replied, I appreciated your unusual intelligence and enterprise, but the trouble with you seems to be that you're thinking only of H. Gernsback, first of all, once more, and then again. Gernsback, however, never wavered in his praise of Tesla, and continued to feature Teslaic articles and drawings in his various periodicals. On the topic of thought transference, as a materialist, Tesla completely rejected any concept related to ESP. However, he did think that it was possible to read out the thoughts of another person's brain by attaching TV equipment to the rods and cones of the retina, which was, in his view, the arena of cognitive processing. This invention, called the Thought Recorder, provided the basis for a number of Frank Paul spectaculars, such as his October 1929 Amazing Stories cover depicting two humans wearing thought-reading helmets. Revisiting Wardenclyffe The 1920s marked a period of turmoil and revolution. Homeostasis had yet to settle in. With the Johnson still in Europe, Tesla was forced to face the painful Wardenclyffe fiasco once again without the solace of his close friends. With his Manhattan attorney, William Raskin, Jr., Tesla took the train out to the Supreme Court of Suffolk County to battle agents for the George C. Bolt estate and the Waldorf Astoria, who were trying once again to recoup approximately $20,000 in unpaid rent. The referee was the Honorable Roland Miles. The case dragged on for months and covered over 300 pages of testimony. Tesla testified that in March 1915, he had put up Wardenclyffe as collateral against past monies owed to Francis S. Hutchins, personal counsel for George C. Bolt and the Waldorf Astoria. Hutchins and the hotel interpreted the transaction as an outright transference of the deed. Since the hotel now thought that they owned the property, they felt that it was their right to resell the land and take down the tower to sell the lumber and other parts for salvage. When Tesla took the stand, he was asked if he remembered the day he delivered the deed. I distinctly remember telling Mr. Hutchins that the plant had cost an enormous amount of money in comparison with which this indebtedness was a trifle, and that I expected great realizations from the plant. Thirty thousand dollars a day if the plant had been completed. Tesla assumed that if he paid the twenty thousand dollars owed, he would have gotten back the plant. He further assumed that the Waldorf Astoria would take good care of the property because of its enormous value. They did not take good care, however. Vandals broke in and stole equipment, such as expensive lathes. Can you describe the structures and any other equipment that was in the laboratory? Tesla's counsel asked. The plaintiff attorneys tried to block the testimony, but the judge allowed Tesla to begin. The inventor sat back, removed his white gloves, placed them on the podium, and proceeded. The building formed a square about 100 feet by 100. It was divided into four compartments, with an office and a machine shop, and two very large areas. The engines were located on one side, and the boilers on the other side, and in the center, the chimney rose. When asked how big the boilers were, Tesla said that there were two 300 horsepower boilers surrounded by two 16,000 gallon water tanks that utilized the ambient heat for hot water. To the right of the boiler plant were the engines. One was a 400-horsepower Westinghouse engine and a 35-kilowatt outfit which, with the engine, drove the dynamo for lighting and furnished other conveniences. There were high and low pressure compressors, various kinds of water pumps, and a main switchboard for operating everything. Towards the road on the railroad side was the machine shop. That compartment was 100 by 35 feet with a door in the middle, and it contained, I think, eight lathes. Then there was a milling machine, a planer and shaper, a spliner, three, 
three drills, four motors, a grinder, and a blacksmith's forge. Now, in the compartment opposite, which was the same size as the machine shop, there was contained the real expensive apparatus. And there were two special glass cases where I kept historical apparatus, which was exhibited and described in my lectures and scientific articles. There were at least a thousand bulbs and tubes, each of which represented a certain phase of scientific development. Then there was also five large tanks, four of which contained special transformers created so as to transform the energy for the plant. They were about, I should say, seven feet high and about five by five feet each, and were filled with special oil, which we call transformer oil, to stand an electrical tension of 60,000 volts. Then there was a fifth similar tank for special purposes. And then there were my electric generating apparatus. That apparatus was precious because it could flash a message across the Atlantic, and yet it was built in 1894 or 1895. The court sat humbled. The opposing attorney tried to block Tesla's further testimony, but the judge allowed the inventor to continue. Beyond the door of this compartment, Tesla continued, there were to be the condensers, what we call electric condensers, which would store the energy and then discharge and make it go around the world. Some of these condensers were in an advanced state of construction, and others were not. Then there was a very expensive piece of apparatus that the Westinghouse Company furnished me. Only two of this kind have ever been constructed. It was developed by myself with their engineers. That was a steel tank which can contained a very elaborate assemblage of coils, an elaborate regulating apparatus, and it was intended to give every imaginable regulation that I wanted in my measurements and control of energy. Tesla also described a special 100 horsepower motor equipped with elaborate devices for rectifying the alternating currents and sending them into the condensers. On this apparatus alone, I spent thousands of dollars. Then, along the center of the room, I had a very precious piece of apparatus. It was Tesla's remote-controlled boat. Was that all there was, generally speaking? Oh, no, nowhere near, Tesla replied. The inventor then proceeded to describe a series of closets that housed numerous other appliances, each representing a different phase of his work. There was the testing room, which included precious instruments given to him by Lord Kelvin a breech, and other instruments such as voltmeters, wattmeters, ampere meters. In that small space, there was a fortune. The opposing attorney asked that the statement, there was a fortune, be taken out. Yes, strike it out, said the judge. Tesla then went on to discuss the tower. After describing the structure above the ground, he described the shaft. You see, Tesla said, the underground work was one of the most expensive parts of the tower. He was referring particularly to special apparatus he invented for gripping the earth. The shaft, Your Honor, was first covered with timber and the inside with steel. In the center of this, there was a winding stair going down, and in the center of the stairs, there was a big shaft again through which the current was to pass, and this shaft was so fit in order to tell exactly where the nodal point is, so that I could calculate exactly the size of the earth or the diameter of the earth and measure it exactly within four feet with that machine. And then the real expensive work was to connect that central part with the earth. And there I had special machines rigged up which would push the iron pipes one length after another. And I pushed, I think, 16 of them 300 feet. The current through these pipes was to take hold of the earth. Now that was a very expensive part of the work, but it does not show on the tower, but it belongs to the tower. The primary purpose of the tower, Your Honor, was to telephone, to send the human voice and likeness around the globe. That was my discovery that I announced in 1893, and now all the wireless plants are doing that. There is no other system being used. Then the idea was to reproduce this apparatus and connect it just with a central station and telephone office so that you may pick up your telephone and if you wanted to talk to a telephone subscriber in Australia, you would simply call up that plant 
and that plant will connect you immediately. And I had contemplated to have press messages, stock quotations, pictures for the press and the reproduction of signatures, checks and everything transmitted from there. But, and then I was going to interest people in a larger project, and the Niagara people had given me 10,000 horsepower. Did you have any conversation with Mr. Hutchins or anybody representing the plaintiffs concerning the taking down of the tower or anything like that? asked the judge. No, sir. It came like a bolt from the blue sky. As the deed had been transferred in a legal manner with Tesla's full compliance, Judge Miles ruled in favor of the hotel. The inventor's lawyer countered arguing that the Waldorf Astoria sold equipment which they did not account for and destroyed a property worth $350,000 to try and recoup the $20,000 owed. The property despoiled exceeded the value of the mortgage and therefore the plaintiffs, the hotel management, should have been held to account to defendant Tesla. Precedent cases were cited. The Waldorf Astoria, however, had the last word. As a solace to the wild hopes of this dreamy inventor, their lawyer wrote, if prior to that time he should grasp in his fingers any one of the castles in Spain which always were floating about in his dreams, and had he paid the board bills which he owed, this wild scrubby woodland, including the Tower of Babel thereon, would cheerfully have been reconveyed to him. By no fair inference or construction, can Tesla's counterclaim make void this judgment? It was merely a sop to the vanity of a brilliant but unpractical mind. The judgment should be affirmed with costs. In the summer of 1922, Robert Johnson and his ailing ambassadress returned to the States from Italy. They arrived in time to attend Paderewski's comeback piano concerto with their elusive friend, at Carnegie Hall in November. Robert's autobiography, Remembered Yesterdays, which was just completed, highlighted not only a memorable meeting between Tesla and Paderewski in the late 1890s, but also the virtuoso's 1919 stint as president of Poland. As the pianist had held office for only ten months, Tesla was moved to jest that it was just long enough to gain publicity for his next tour. That's a terrible thing to say, Mr. Tesla. Kate sparkled as they stepped into the limousine that was to take the trio to the opening. Dressed in black capes, canes, and silk high hats, the tall, angular gentleman struck a smart pair as they accompanied the suddenly recovering and radiant Mrs. Filipov. Seeing Paderewski again is like falling in love all over, she said between her men. Tesla looked down and noticed the sorrow that lay hidden beneath her brow. His was apparent to her as well. Robert's upper lip held them steady. The Bolsheviks were taking over in Russia. Communist and anarchist uprisings reverberated throughout the world. In the United States, there were race riots in Chicago, Negro lynchings in Minnesota, a suspicious explosion outside the J.P. Morgan building in New York, killing 30 people and wounding 300 others and 40,000 Klansmen marching on Washington. It was time to do something to stop the tide. So Attorney General A. M. Palmer rounded up 300 communists and 67 anarchists in 33 cities. The last group arrested faced deportation for bombing out the windows and homes of Palmer and also Assistant Secretary of the Navy Franklin Roosevelt. Eugene V. Debs, still in prison for violating the Espionage Act, was nominated once again to run for president by the Socialist Party. Woodrow Wilson received the Nobel Peace Prize. The election of 1920 was the first to be broadcast by radio to a national audience. Leader Forrest announced the wrong winner four years earlier to a much smaller crowd. With his running mate, Calvin Coolidge, Warren Harding trounced Democratic contender James Cox and vice presidential hopeful Franklin Roosevelt. By this time, RCA was a mega corporation, writing million dollar checks to John Hayes Hammond Jr. and Edwin Armstrong. Having uncovered a great new market, RCA had increased its radio audience in 1924 to five million listeners. 
profits were made not only in selling airspace to advertisers, but also in selling the radios themselves. By 1928, national broadcasts would link all 48 states, and soon after, regular shows featuring Buck and Will Rogers, Amos and Andy, Burns and Allen, The Shadow, Stoopnagel and Bud, and Jack Benny would become daily fare. Such advertisers as Lucky Strike, Maxwell House, Canada Dry, Chesterfield and Pontiac would soon insinuate themselves into the mass psyche. Tesla would say that he cared not to listen to the radio because he found it too distracting. Other milestones during this period included the anointment of the Manasseh Mauler Jack Dempsey as world heavyweight champion, a soaring stock market, and a number of key trials, most notably Sacco and Bensetti's alleged anarchists accused of murder, the Scopes Monkey Trial, and the $500 fine and 10-day incarceration of Mae West for lewd improvisations during her hit Broadway play, Sex. Newest crazies included speakeasies, Al Capone, flap addresses, and such dances as the Charleston, Waltzing Till You Dropped, and the Shimmy. Although the radio was czar at home, for a night on the town, silent movies were king. Deaths during the Roaring Twenties included T.C. Martin, Jacob Schiff, Henry Clay Frick, Andrew Carnegie, Enrico Caruso, William Röntgen, Alexander Graham Bell, Woodrow Wilson, Warren Harding, and the 31-year-old heartthrob Rudolph Valentino, who along with Harry Houdini died of a ruptured appendix, Vladimir Lenin, Sarah Bernhardt, Princess Lawaf Palali, and Catherine Johnson, who passed on during autumn 1925. October 15, 1925. Dear Tesla, it was Mrs. Johnson's injunction that last night of her life that I should keep in touch with Tesla. This is a pretty hard thing to do, but it will not be my fault if it is not done. Yours faithfully, Luca. The Mysterious Mr. Patini Throughout the world, wireless inventors were becoming a precious commodity. In Italy, Mussolini adroitly redirected the Italian Senate's fascist salute to Guglielmo Marconi for having established a national broadcasting system. A few years later, Il Duce approached Jack Hammond to institute a foolproof secret radio system, which to Jack's later revulsion became a tool for killing anti-fascists. In the Soviet Union, Lenin contacted Tesla to ask him to come over to his country to institute his AC polyphase and regional power distribution stations. Sending emissaries to lure the Serbian nobleman, Tesla became enmeshed in a shady organization known as the Friends of Soviet Russia. With over five million people dying there of famine in 1922, the celebrated inventor had been approached by Ivan Mashukiev of the Russian Workers' Club of Manhattan and by Elsie Blanc, a communist leader from Massachusetts, to speak at a monster mass meeting at the Grange Hall in Springfield in June 1922. The purpose of the conclave, which was co-organized by a group of Italian radicals, was ostensibly to raise money for clothing and food for the starving and dying people people of Russia. Since a Russian bomb factory was discovered in a warehouse in Manhattan at that time, no doubt some of the funds were also siphoned off for more nefarious activities. Travelling to Springfield with Mashufkiev, who described with considerable imagination the manufacturing industries of Russia, Tesla heard the first speaker announce that the only solution to the economic problem in Europe was in the hands of the working class which will have a charge of all means of production. They will do this for humanity's sake and not for profit. The speaker prophesied that an economic collapse of the entire industrial structure of Europe will come, and when it does, the working class will then secure full control of affairs. The speaker emphatically stated that the famine in Russia today is caused by counter-revolutionary forces backed by world capitalists, and not because of the alleged poor rule of the Bolshevists. According to Adrian Potter, the FBI agent who monitored the event, Nikola Tesla was addressed by several Italians as Bettini. Tesla, or Bettini, 
prophesied that Italy was soon to adopt a communist form of government. Clearly Tesla was, in some sense, a revolutionary and on the side of the worker, but more for the purpose of transforming and uplifting their station. Tesla's inventions were purposely constructed so as to reduce consumer cost, preserve natural resources, and relieve humanity of unnecessary manual labor. The Serb believed in the profit motive and strove all his life to become what Lenin loathed, so the reader should read this FBI report with caution, as Tesla's supposed statement and motive for attending the meeting are not totally clear. Most likely, he was concerned with the plight of the starving people in Russia. The U.S. government would send a reported $60 million in aid to feed the Soviets over the next decade and he was also looking to sell his inventions to this new regime with an accompanying vast potential market. Where the Soviet leadership sought Tesla out, the aging gnome wizard and odd combination capitalist socialist Charles Steinmetz initiated his own contact, writing the Soviet Premier a letter in February 1922. Wishing Lenin success, Steinmetz expressed confidence that he would complete the astonishing work of social and industrial construction which Russia has undertaken under difficult circumstances. Joining a variety of Soviet organizations, Steinmetz also publicized his correspondence with Lenin and published two papers in the electrical world that described Russia's electrification plans. Scratching his gnarled arthritic fingernails on GE's capitalist blackboard, the self-righteous $100,000 per year supposed academic implacably called for American capital to support the project. Although Lenin's correspondence with Tesla has not been located, his response to Steinmetz is well known. Lenin replied that to my shame he had heard the name of Steinmetz only several months ago, thanked Steinmetz for his help, but suggested that the absence of diplomatic relations between the United States and Soviet Russia would impede its implementation. Lenin, however, would publish the note from the prominent engineer and send Steinmetz an autographed photograph of himself, which he received a few months later. Just one year later, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, a four-foot giant of electrical engineering, bon vivant, and family man, was dead. He was 58. Tesla was living on Fifth Avenue, two blocks from Central Park, in the Hotel St. Regis, room 1607, for the years 1920 to 1923. Commuting to Milwaukee and paying an exorbitant $15 a day in rent, the inventor neglected to compensate the hotel for a seven-month period and was promptly sued for the balance over $3,000. Forced to find other premises, he moved into the Hotel Marguerite on Park Avenue and 48th Street, just a few blocks from his favorite stomping grounds, Bryant Park behind the New York Public Library and the Great Commuters Hall at Grand Central Station. After hours in the dead of night, the inventor would grab his coat, cane, white gloves, and derby, and prance out for a tour of the park by the library where he cogitated and fed his precious pigeons. Rumors began spreading about the gaunt eccentric who fed the pigeons, as Tesla purposely kept his identity concealed. Midnight is the hour he chooses for his visits. Tall, well-dressed, of dignified bearing, the man whistles several times, a signal for the pigeons on the ledges of the building to flutter down about his feet. With a generous hand, the man scatters peanuts on the lawn from a bag. A proud man, yet humble in his charities. Nikola Tesla. According to several researchers, Tesla was a homosexual, and it was supposedly there in the Hotel Marguerite that he liked to meet his special friends. More likely a celibate, the inventor did have one homosexual admirer, the young journalist Kenneth Sweezy. Born in 1905 and raised in a Brooklyn apartment where he stayed his whole life, Sweezy had constructed his first radio at the age of 13 during the height of World War I. Shortly thereafter, forsaking secondary school, he began to write scientific articles for a number of the local newspapers and magazines and eventually a textbook on chemistry. Able to reduce complex ideas to a level understandable by the masses, Sweezy was later congratulated by Albert Einstein for explaining Archimedes' principle. Having sifted through the data on the wireless, Sweezy came to realize that Tesla was the unsung author of the invention and sought the hermit out for an interview. With a round, boyish face, glasses, and a quick and perceptive mind, 
Sweezy quickly endeared himself to Tesla, who expressed surprise at the writer's youth. Only nineteen at the time, Sweezy and Tesla began a special friendship that would last until the end of the inventor's life. Often they would meet in Tesla's apartment to go over some articles Sweezy was writing, or to discuss aspects of Tesla's work. Afterward, the youngster might join the inventor for dinner, or Tesla would walk the boy back to the gate of the subway. As the friendship grew, the aging sage also came to rely on Sweezy when he needed assistance, and by the time he was in his late seventies, their friendship became so familiar that, according to Sweezy, Tesla sometimes greeted him at the door stark naked. As the years progressed, Tesla's new publicist became virtually one of the family, befriending Agnes Holden, Robert John. Johnson's daughter, and also Sava Kozanovich, Tesla's nephew, who often traveled to New York from the newly formed Yugoslavia as its first ambassador. Sweezy, who himself described Tesla as an absolute celibate, began to compile a large holding of articles, letters, and original manuscripts as he raced unwittingly Jack O'Neill, Tesla's other journalist compadre, to write the quintessential biography. Concerning Tesla's habits, Sweezy confirmed that the inventor rarely slept. Tesla claimed he slept less than two hours per night. The inventor, however, did admit to dozing from time to time to recharge his batteries. For exercise, the inventor would walk eight to ten miles per day and also loosen up in the bathtub. Although he also touted a waterless bath, which involved charging his body with electricity in such a way as to repel all foreign particles. Later, Tesla would add to his repertoire the squishing and unsquishing of his toes, one hundred times for each foot every night. He claimed the practice stimulated his brain cells. And how this man worked! I will tell you about a little episode. I was sleeping in my room like one dead. It was three after midnight. Suddenly, the telephone ring awakened me. Through my sleep, I heard his voice: "Sweezy, how are you? What are you doing?" This was one of many conversations in which I did not succeed in participating. He spoke animatedly with pauses as he worked out a problem, comparing one theory to another, commenting, and when he felt he had arrived at the solution, he suddenly closed the telephone. In 1926, shortly after moving to the Hotel Pennsylvania, the inventor agreed to an interview for Collier's magazine. The 68-year-old philosopher chose as his topic of the evening. The female of the species, viewing the women's movement as one of the most profound portents of the future, the tall, thin, ascetic man told the interviewer, "This struggle of the human female towards sex equality will end in a new sex order with the female as superior." Happy with the article, Tesla forwarded a copy to Anne Morgan, with whom he still kept in touch, and Anne wrote back to review her own twenty-year odyssey. As an advocate in the women's movement, during this same time period, Tesla divulged in the world his unbridled attachment to the city's pigeons. Sometimes I feel that by not marrying, I made too great a sacrifice to my work, he told the reporter. So I have decided to lavish all the affection of a man no longer young on the feathery tribe. I am satisfied if anything I do will live for posterity. But to care for those homeless, hungry, or sick birds is the delight of my life. It is my only means of playing. In the same article, Tesla poignantly reveals a fondness for one particular pigeon that had a broken wing and leg. Using all my mechanical knowledge, I invented a device by which I supported its body in comfort in order to let the bones heal. Carrying the bird up to his suite, Tesla calculated. That it cost me more than two thousand dollars to cure her. It took over a year and one half of daily care, and afterward Tesla hand carried the bird to one of his favorite farms, where it is now one of the finest and prettiest birds I have ever seen. Concerning his potential affinity for males, Tesla certainly displayed an affection for muscle men, often in the later years inviting boxers such as Henry Doherty, Jimmy Abnick, and the Yugoslav welterweight champion. Fritzi Zivic out to dinner or to his apartment, having made a study of the 1892 championship match between gentleman Jim Corbett and John L. Sullivan, which had been held in New Orleans. Tesla made the sports headlines in 1927 
by predicting the outcome of the rematch between Gene Tunney and Jack Dempsey, the Manasseh Mauler, having been deposed the year before in a ten-round decision. Dr. Tesla picks Tunney on basis of mechanics. Sitting in the suite of the Hotel Pennsylvania, the 71-year-old inventor did not hedge or pussyfoot, but declared that Tunney was at least a ten-to-one favorite. Tunney will hit Dempsey continuously and at will. In addition, he's single, and other things being equal, the single man can always excel the married man. Dr. Tesla smiled significantly. He is a lifelong bachelor. With Catherine's death came a new level of intimacy between Tesla and Luca. Often they would meet for dinner or at the cinema, and when Spanish-American war hero Richmond P. Hobson returned with his wife to live in the city, he would join them. According to Mrs. Hobson, these two dear friends, Tesla and Hobson, about once a month or sometimes oftener, would meet and go to a movie and then sit in the park and talk till after midnight. Richmond always came home with enthusiasm over some new invention of Tesla's, and well I recall the night he told Richmond, I can shake the world of its orbit, but I won't do it, Hobson. Certainly Tesla's relationship with Catherine had been at least at one time provocative, and no doubt he reviewed details with Hobson, but apparently, according to his own words, he had never touched a woman. One could make a case for a germ phobia, although his relationship with the pigeons would seem to dispel that myth. Magnified greatly by the O'Neill biography, or Tesla's aversion to sexual intimacy with women, could be evaluated from a psychoanalytic perspective. In 1924, Tesla wrote in a condolence note to Jack Morgan, The mother's loss grips one's head more powerfully than any other sad experience in life. 44 faster than the speed of light, 1927 to 1940. June 1931, Potsdam, Germany. Dear Mr. Tesla, I am happy to hear that you are celebrating your 75th birthday, and that as a successful pioneer in the field of high-frequency currents, you have been able to witness the wonderful development of this field of technology. I congratulate you on the magnificent success of your life's work. Albert Einstein For the balance of the wizard's life, he would continue to speak cryptically about a number of entirely new and revolutionary inventions. These included A, a machine for harnessing cosmic rays, B, a means for transmitting mechanical energy, C, a particle beam weapon, and D, a mechanism for communicating with other planets. In addition, Tesla also continued to refer to E, his Wardenclyffe idea. The identification of each separate invention became a somewhat confusing task for journalists and researchers because each of these ideas involves the transmission of energy to distant places. And the third invention, the so-called death ray, apparently in its final form, comprised features from some, if not all, of the other inventions. Throughout Tesla's 70s, that is, from the mid-1920s until about 1934, Tesla continued his practice of traveling to industrial centers throughout the Northeast and Midwest in his quest to market his wares. While commuting to Philadelphia during the years 1924 to 1925 to work on his gasoline turbine, he had worked on the steam turbine in Chicago and Milwaukee, Tesla met with John B. Flowers, inspector of airplanes and engines at the local naval aircraft factory. He had known the inspector since 1917. As it became more apparent that the bladeless turbine was stuck in the endless cycle of research and development, Tesla returned to his first love, wireless transmission of power, and began a publicity campaign to espouse its merits. By implementing a series of central stations to pump energy into the ground and surrounding medium, the ultimate conservationist pragmatist theorized that airplanes and automobiles equipped with specially designed receiving devices could operate without fuel on board. They would simply derive their power from his towers. On October the 10th, 1925, Flowers traveled to New York City to confer with the wizard and his suite at the Hotel Pennsylvania. There they drafted out the entire scheme so that it could be presented to physicist J. H. Dillinger head of the Radio Laboratory, Bureau of Standards, in Washington, D.C. 
In a carefully worded ten-page document, complete with schematic drawings of the Earth imbued with Tesla-created standing waves, Flowers unveiled a plan for operating cars and planes powered by electromagnetism. Dr. Tesla said that the wireless power system would supply power to airplanes at any point around the Earth, Flowers told Dillinger. In addition, Flowers continued, Dr. Tesla has already developed the oscillator to provide the power and is willing to furnish the U.S. government his plans if they agree to build the plant. Flowers also set up a meeting in Washington to go over the proposal. In the interim, Dillinger referred the proposal to H.L. Curtis, a fellow expert. After canny consideration, Curtis rejected the plan, his main objection being that as he understood it, Tesla's scheme was to create standing electrical waves around the Earth as a sphere. There would be then considerable concentration of energy at the nodes, and it was at the nodal points Tesla expected to develop his energy. The system proposed by Mr. Flowers does not have this feature. He proposes to collect energy at any point. Thus, some means would have to be devised for concentrating this energy and making it available. No such method is proposed, and I do not think of any that appears feasible. Furthermore, I do not know of any wireless apparatus of sufficient magnitude to warrant the expectation that power can be economically transmitted by radio methods. The basic criticism that the energy would not be available at any point of the globe, but only at the nodal points, was countered on numerous occasions by Tesla, although apparently the towers, which were not near power sources, would have to be placed at nodal points. One of Tesla's favorite analogies was to view electricity as a kind of fluid and his magnifying transmitters as a series of pumps. Just as with a hydraulic system, the fluid would be present at all points in equal pressures so too would Tesla's electrical oscillations. And just as electrical energy is present at every connected electrical outlet in the world, but is not used until an appliance is plugged in, so too was Tesla's electricity available, but not used until the receiver was turned on. In a comprehensive article published in Telegraph and Telephone Age in October 1927, which was probably written as a rebuttal to Curtis and Dillinger, Tesla also explains that the oscillations would spread from the magnifying transmitter with a theoretically infinite speed, slowing down first very quickly and afterward at a lesser rate until the distance is about 6,000 miles, when it proceeds with the speed of light. From there on, it again increases in speed, slowly at first and then more rapidly, reaching the antipode with approximately infinite velocity. The law of motion can be expressed by stating that the waves on the terrestrial surface sweep in equal intervals of time over equal areas. But it must be understood that the current penetrates deep into the earth, and the effects produced on the receivers are the same as if the whole flow was confined to the earth's axis, joining the transmitter with the antipode. The mean surface speed is thus about 471,200 kilometers per second. 57% greater than that of the so-called Hertz waves. Tesla likened the effect to the moon shadow spreading over the Earth during an eclipse. Here was the first of a number of instances in which Tesla disagreed with the findings of Einstein's theory of relativity, as the so-called Tesla wave supposedly traveled faster than light. In 1928, Tesla traveled to Philadelphia to attempt construction of his helicopter airplane probably with John Flowers, and to Detroit to try to market it as a flying automobile to GM. On a more practical level, he also peddled his speedometer to the Ford Motor Company. One of the problems in the speedometer was cost, the Tesla invention having become a premium item only found in the more expensive vehicles. He also visited with his nephew, Nicholas Tebeyevich, who was helping fund the helicopter and who was on the verge of becoming very wealthy from his various automobile inventions associated with economizing the transmission and steering. Tebeyevich, like his uncle, was somewhat of a workaholic, and Tesla cautioned his wife to give her husband unceasing care and love, as in the long run your husband is sure to acquire great wealth, and when his battle is won, you will have everything to your heart's desire. Shortly after Tesla returned to Detroit, and met Terbayevich for a late snack at the Book Cadillac Hotel, the city's finest, according to William Terbo, the maitre d' suggested they wait five minutes, 
when the $5 cover charge would be lifted. Tesla would hear none of it and marched in. As this was during the Great Depression, when a quarter would buy three hot dogs and two Cokes, this wasted expense was enormous, and it became a great point for laughter among the Tervayevich family, which tended to view Tesla as simply their old eccentric uncle, rather than one of the most important inventors in the world. When the nephew tried tactfully to bring up the matter of the cover charge, Tesla evaded by responding, I'll never die rich unless the money comes in the door faster than I can shovel it out the window. During this period, 1925 to 1938, Tesla also negotiated with Myron Taylor, CEO of U.S. Steel. Interested in the steel company for a variety of reasons, the ever-prodigious inventor had developed special equipment for purifying ores, degasification of steel, and also conservation of sulfur during iron processing. In the late 1920s, he asked Taylor if he could install equipment to see if the procedure worked. Taylor agreed, and so Tesla traveled up to their Worcester plant in September 1931 to install it. Although he hoped for a successful demonstration, this apparently did not occur since the archives of U.S. Steel have only one short paragraph referring to Tesla's dealings with the company. Tesla's ultimate plan, which apparently was not tested, was to install his bladeless turbine in the heat exhaust system with the idea of converting the enormous amount of wasted heat into useful electricity. Ever the conservationist, this was one of Tesla's most elegant ideas. From Worcester, Tesla moved on to Buffalo for a top-secret experiment according to Peter Savo, a cousin living in New York. There the inventor reportedly refitted an automobile that, according to the story, ran on electrical power from an outside source. The car was a standard Pierce Arrow, with the engine removed and certain other components installed instead. The standard clutch, gearbox and drivetrain remained. Under the hood, there was a brushless electric motor, connected to or in place of the engine. Tesla would not divulge who made the motor. Set into the dash was a power receiver consisting of a box containing 12 radio tubes. A vertical antenna consisting of a six-foot rod was installed and connected to the power receiver, which was in turn connected to the motor by two heavy conspicuous cables. Tesla pushed these in before starting and said, We now have power. If this tale is to be believed, it would mean that Tesla had also installed one of his powerful oscillators somewhere near Niagara Falls to provide the wireless energy needed to power the vehicle. An alternative possibility was that Tesla was testing one of his gasoline or steam turbines in the automobile, and Savo mistook it for the wireless device. The aging inventor, a tall, thin, almost spiritual figure in the sort of brown cutaway suit that older men wore before the World War, received interviewers in one of the public rooms in the Hotel New Yorker where he lives. Before he would speak of his present work, he reviewed his past achievements, which entitled him more than Edison, Steinmetz, or any other, to be called the father of the power age. There was a new king of the hill. Ever since the 1919 confirmation of his theory of relativity that space was curved and that light traveled at a constant speed irrespective of the movement of its source, Einstein began to occupy the spot formerly held by such technical wizards as Bell, Edison, the Wright brothers, or Tesla. First postulated in 1905, Einstein's theories not only shifted the prevailing space-time paradigm, that self-assuring Newtonian world that the old guard grew up in, his theories also threatened Tesla's position as premier mastermind. Although the measurement of the starlight bending around the sun during the 1919 eclipse was experimental proof of Einstein's new postulate, for the most part the theoretical physicist was exactly that, a theorist, whereas Tesla, as hands-on creator of new technologies, was able to prove out his assumptions in the everyday world. This was the inventor's advantage, and he used it to attack the new Nobel Prize-winning upstart. As Einstein's theory abandoned the old 19th century ether, it explained the bending of light rays around large bodies as being caused by the non-Euclidean curving of space-time. This, in essence, became the new and more abstract ether. Mathematical equations accurately predicted the precise amount of bending that occurred. In general relativity, the gravitational field and the structure or geometry of space are identical. The gravitational field 
is the curved space. Tesla completely disagreed with the concept of space being curved, saying that it was self-contradictory. Since every action is accompanied by an equivalent reaction, it appeared to Tesla's simple mind that the curved spaces must react on the bodies and producing the opposite effect, straighten out the curves. To Tesla, the light bent because the large body, e.g. the sun, had a force field which influenced it. Ironically, Einstein's contemporaries at the Carnegie Institution of Washington were using the Tesla coil in their new 1929 experiments in attempting to split the atom, while Tesla was discussing a more esoteric source of energy, cosmic rays. A principle by which power for driving the machinery of the world may be derived from the cosmic energy which operates the universe has been discovered by Nikola Tesla, noted physicist and inventor. This principle, which taps a source of power described as everywhere present and unlimited quantities, and which may be transmitted by wire or wireless from central plants to any part of the globe, will eliminate the need of coal, oil, gas, or any other of the common fuels. The central source of cosmic energy for the Earth is the sun, Dr. Tesla said, but night will not interrupt the flow of the new power supply. On July the 10th, 1931, Tesla turned 75. Time honored the senior inventor by placing his portrait on the cover. Tesla's life was briefly reviewed, and his most recent mysterious research on harnessing an entirely new and unsuspected source of energy was discussed. Unwilling to reveal more about the adjuvant, the venerated iconoclast startled the interviewer by referring obliquely to his most esoteric invention, the Tesla scope a device for signaling the nearby stars. I think that nothing can be more important than interplanetary communication. It will certainly come some day, and the certitude that there are other human beings in the universe working, suffering, struggling like ourselves, will produce a magic effect on mankind, and will form the foundation of a universal brotherhood that will last as long as humanity itself. Hugo Gernsback couldn't have said it better. Simultaneously, Kenneth Sweezy wrote a flurry of letters to every notable he could think of, requesting a birthday greeting. Accolades poured in, many quoted throughout this text, from E. F. Alexanderson, B. A. Berendt, W. H. Bragg, Leda Forrest, Gano Dunn, Jack Hammond, A. E. Kennelly, Arthur Korn, Oliver Lodge, Robert Milliken, D. McFarlane Moore, Valdemar Poulsen, Charles F. Scott. George Graf von Arco, H. H. Westinghouse, and Albert Einstein. VIPs who wrote back to decline included Guglielmo Marconi and Mikhail Pupin. By October, Thomas Alva Edison was dead. The lights in the city were dimmed in honor of the great man's passing. Perhaps it was the death of his nemesis, or the new round of adulation, or Tesla's advanced age that prompted him to alter his style of avoiding publicity. Whatever the reason, from 1931 on, the inventor made it an annual practice on his birthday to invite the press to his flat and announce his latest discoveries. With the talent of a mystery writer, the electrician stretched out the...